Voice of College Football here, talking up Washington State football. We're going right to the top, and hit man Jake Dickert going into his second season as head coach with the Cougars. Coach, how are you doing today? No, it's great. I really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Uh, great to go right to the source to get uh, thoughts on Washington State football coming off 7-6 and six last season bowl appearance against central michigan so we're going to go back to october 21 so it's only been about eight or nine months ago and suddenly you're thrust into a pretty difficult situation um you know i'm sure it was a challenge for the team just coming off a of covid season in terms of continuity team only played a handful of games the year before really being unified as a team not because there was anything wrong but just because of the challenges of getting together for football for for a full football season then you jump into 2021, you're only about six games deep, and all of a sudden, yet the uh, dismissal of head coach Nick Rolovich, you take the head coaching job again. It's not like it was an offseason that you could implement your system and get rolling, um, yet a number of coaches have to leave as, as well. So you really had to throw together a situation in which you know, you're facing a really good BYU team right out of the gate. And just talk about the challenges, the adversity of taking on a situation like that. Well, I think the biggest thing to, to remember is there was a lot of people in all of college football and the whole landscape were facing a, a myriad of challenges all, all across, you know, every program. And, you know, Washington State was, was one of the many. Uh, but the one thing I love to tell people all the time is I got an opportunity as the, the, a football coach to live out what I tell our guys each and every day. And it's how you respond to adversity and your resiliency is going to equal your growth. And to have a situation where I was now the one, you know, in, in front of the team and an opportunity to really bond these guys together was something special. And we had a great group of kids. We were very talented. You know, it was amazing, you know, to get to that point and really hoping that if we didn't have any distractions, we felt like we could win the Pac-12 North. And that was exciting for our football team. Uh, but the biggest thing is the guys wanted to keep going. And I took all that energy, right? There's a lot of different things that guys were feeling and, and emotions at that time. And we pointed it in the same direction and we all came together, but it was player driven. You know, I got an opportunity to go out front and set the message, set the tones. But at the same time, those guys from within wanted to do it. And we lost to a BYU team, you know, by a botched extra points. Uh, and I think that moment after that game in that locker room was the turning point. Uh, the guys knew from that point on, we had everything we needed right here. Yes, we were down six coaches, okay? But at the same time, we had each other. And I think that was a special moment. And we were mulling into the bye week, which we desperately needed to get healthy. And I see you just, that team just turned over from that point on. And it was really special. But I really give credit to an amazing senior class and a group of players that wanted to keep going. And, and that's what galvanized us together. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jake, uh, you got a pretty uh, diverse experience on the defensive side of the ball as you've gone up a, a number of levels, but at the same time, you're still a young guy, and I'm sure thinking about a head coaching job. We're all young uh, guys now. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably aging pretty quickly trying That's to get right. this team ready for 22. But, uh, you know, this this is what most guys look to achieve, getting a Power 5 job, head coaching job. And uh, it, it happened rather quickly. I know that's easy for me to say, but you've certainly sure. paid your dues uh, yeah. through a number of programs. Uh, so now that you've got a job at this level and, and you're facing a difficult schedule, difficult challenge, uh, yeah. we'll get to the division format here in a second, because obviously that's changed on a dime. Just uh, talk about, you know, what it's like to lead a Power 5 program versus maybe what you thought it was like five years ago. Well, it's, a, it's funny because 15 years ago, I started on this journey. I would have done anything to get to scholarship football. I was just a Division three guy. I love coaching. And, man, if I could just get to scholarship football, it would be amazing. And when I finally did that, and then this journey that, you know, this college uh, football game has taken me and my family on has, has been amazing. Uh, but to get here and sit in this seat now is everything that I dreamed of and worked for and had a goal set out you know, really by the time I was 40 to make sure I accomplished that. And I think you've seen a lot of younger head coaches because there's an energy to this game that I think you need in recruiting, in relationships, in team building. And it's a new way of thinking about a lot of different things. And one of my biggest passions in life is leadership. 
right? So what I think you do from taking yourself a little bit out of the X's and O's portion of the everyday grind, which I loved, you get an opportunity to now to affect 125 guys on our roster. And I think that's what's really special about this role. I'm learning something new each and every day. I'm learning the power of that special word, no, right? You can't do everything in every direction, uh, but it's what I love doing. And I think we've got a great group of kids here at Washington State to work with. I think uh, assembling a staff, uh, that was the, my biggest mentor was Craig Bull, and he said it never ends, right? But surround yourself with people that really want to be a part of what you're doing, and they want to stay because stability and development is going to be key, especially for a place here like Washington State. So we went out and did that. We've hired 22 new people in our building. There's a great energy about it. And I think they're really believing in our message and what we can do here together, right? We might not have the biggest, the brightest, the best, but we have the right, the right people, the right players, the right support staff, the right system in place to go out there and be successful. And, and that's what we're about here at Washington State. Jake, what you alluded to off the top, I got to think, is a is a big challenge for a guy that at the core is teacher, instructor, mentor. Want to get your hand in the dirt right next to the offensive line and go through things, but at the same time, you got to be looking at big picture. You got to be thinking big picture, and so you got to kind of blend the two, maintain the relationships, uh, and, and be the coach and the teacher, and don't lose sight of that. But you got to be CEO at the same time. And that was the biggest thing for me because I've been around a couple of different styles of, of head coaches, one that have been very involved on the side of the ball. I think your team feels that. OK, and I've been around Craig Bull and John Stiglmeyer and others that have been the head coach of the team. And my biggest mission over these last six months through spring were for our players to understand that I'm the head coach of the team, not the head coach of defense. And I think there's there's a difference in that. Um, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm not involved in those decisions, but I'm involved in decisions on both sides of the ball. I want both to be successful. I'm a cheerleader for both sides when we're out at practice, right? You know, I sit in both guys' meetings and the unit meetings and all those things. So it was really important for our team because half of that team really knew me, right? I was the defensive coordinator. And the other half of that team uh, last year, you know, we we're, we we're challenged against each other a lot of the time. So it's important to step out of that role and, and see the big picture. And I, I believe that's what we were able to do. Jake, I hate to break this to you, but you probably automatically during this offseason have become the second most famous Washington State football person to Cameron Ward. He isn't even taking a stab, but he's probably more famous than you are. It's Everybody across the nation is talking about this guy. You've yeah. seen him on the field in practice day after day after day. Through 47 touchdowns at the FCS level, what what is he going to bring to the table? Well, I think first and foremost, you got to talk about Cam Ward, the leader, the person. You know, he walked into a challenging situation. You know, it's not always easy for a transfer player to come in and kind of reestablish himself at a new place. But what we're seeing is a player that is taking that freshman to sophomore year jump within an offense. He's just doing it at two different places, which is, you know, unique. And that's what uh, the transfer portal will provide going forward. So Cam Ward to stay combined with Eric Morris, I think is something that's really special, uh, but can make all the throws. I'm just so impressed with his maturity and his decision making. He loves the film room. Uh, we give him a lot of freedom in our quarterback driven offense. If he doesn't like a look, he changes the play. And there's 100 percent confidence in him being a playmaker. You know, I try to instill that in him first and foremost. You know, there's things that we can improve, right? The platform in which you throw, some of the arm angle stuff, but go out there and play the way you need to play. And that comes with some mistakes, right? But I'll I'll take those, right? I'm behind you all the way. And I just think the, the sky's the limit for Cam. Yet the best part about Cam is he knows he can still grow, right? He's not a finished product by any means. He was a wing T quarterback in high school. Right. So he's been doing this true quarterback thing for only a couple of years. And as a coach and as a guy that loves teaching and developing, I'm excited to have Cam just to see where where he can be in in the next two to three years. Travell Harris and uh, Calvin yeah. Jackson, they caught a few passes between them, <laughs> like 140 yeah. some. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're going to be missed. And, and, it, and it's a good thing for your program that you can show, hey, these guys signed NFL contracts, but they're going to be missed. So, you know, Max Borgie at running back, he moves on to the next level as well. Hopefully he can find a place. Um, so in regards to skill position players, there's a lot of turnover there. A lot of new guys are going to have to step up. 
Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing that really came out of the spring in, in all our skill positions. A, we added a tight end, and that's going to be a process. You know, we didn't just lose Max. We lost Max and Dion, which was a one-two punch, and obviously the receivers that you talked about. But that those group of men are fighting for consistency. We've seen the flashes, okay? Dejan Stribling, Renard Bell is coming back off of injury, who was a, a staple player a couple of years ago. Lincoln Victor is ready for his time and his moment. Robbie Farrell is a transfer. Uh, Zariah Beeson has come in as a transfer. You know, so we've added to our group, and we want to be ultra competitive on that side of the ball. And I think that's something, as we talk about a shift in energy and scheme, we needed a shift in our competitive nature. And I think that's what those guys have done. They're raising the tide of everyone around them now, and I think it's exciting. But we had a bunch of guys. I mean, those are five guys you mentioned. We got a bunch of guys that are on scholarship here that want to play and want to prove who they are. And, uh, you know, we're just fighting for that consistency right now. And throughout a summer work and back in the fall and a little bit more comfort with our scheme, I, I think that's what we'll see come fall camp. I was going to mention Deion McIntosh. I wasn't quite sure if he was back or not. So you lose another five or 600 yards there. And Renard yeah. Bell, he, he's been yeah. with the program forever. He was playing he, under Mike Leach. Seven years oh. now. Uh, through <laughs> yes. uh, med red shirts, medicals, and COVID. He's now a seven-year guy just like Van Wilder. We're excited for him. We're not going to forget the offensive line. People forget the offensive line, but if they don't do the job, none of that works on offense. So uh, what do you need to work out there? Yeah, I think it's our biggest group that we're still mixing and matching with. Uh, we brought in Grant Stevens, a, a transfer from Northern Colorado, and just kind of see where the pieces fit. We feel like we have the pieces. Um, but, you know, Kingston will be a left tackle, but we'll kind of mix and match as far as guards and tackles with, with that core group. And I think there's still a lot of development and just kind of unifying that, that core that, that we need at that position. So everyone knows how important the line of scrimmage is. No one's going to invest in it probably in a program, you know, more than myself. Uh, so we need to reestablish where we're at there because I, I believe we can be, be good at that position here at Washington State. Coach, we'll get to, to your side of the football. You got a new defensive coordinator there with Brian Ward. And we also have uh, Justice Rogers, Jihad Woods. They move on. Nobody's played more football at Washington State than those two guys. 56 starts apiece. You bring in some nice. transfers from Nevada. Uh, what do you like about the defense and what do you still need to work on? So let's start up front because uh, we bring everybody back up front, right? So it's time for that front. RJ Stone was a first team all conference player. Brennan Jackson, I believe, is poised to have his best season since he's been a Coug. He's finally been healthy throughout the offseason. And then Antonio Pule, Amir Muhajid, guys like that. You're just seeing this extra COVID year now as they came to us out of junior college, taking those next steps, right? So that group needs to be even more disruptive than we've been. And Coach Ward is, is a little bit different as far as myself. He lets those guys attack and go make a little bit more plays. And I think that's exactly what we need because the majority of that group is, is experienced, right? So let those guys go make plays. And then we're re replacing the core of our defense. And I think Dayon Henley is one that every college uh, football writer and person in the country needs to really put on their radar. He's as athletic as any person I've ever coached. And you got four guys from the University of Wyoming that are still in the league today. Uh, paired him with Travion Brown, who's been, you know, kind of Justice Rogers, uh, you know, back up the last couple of years and he's ready to shine. And Jordan Lee has really stabilized that strong safety position. So uh, we're excited about where we're at. Armani Marsh at the nickel position has been as steady as any player, um, you know, in the defensive backfield in, in the Pac-12. So we're excited about what we have and fitting those pieces. But up front, we got to be more disruptive, and I believe we can be. So the Pac-12 announced yesterday that um, the divisions are going to be disbanded. Uh, the schedule still stays the same for 22, but uh, they're going to go right to it um, this season and just set up the one versus two matchup in terms of seeding for the Pac-12 championship game. So obviously, you know, you can't control that. You just go to your day-to-day -day and prepare the football team. Any any thoughts, though, about, you know, uh, definitely a situation in which the Pac-12 is looking to kind of set the trend for college football and, and be a leader in, in changing things? Well, I think competition is one of our core values here at Washington State. And when you sit back and you look at the scheduling model and, you know, how do you argue the two best winning percentages in conference play aren't playing in the championship game? 
right? You can't sit in a group of 12 coaches and, and argue that that's not the case. So I think we all felt unanimously that that was the opportunity that we had to, to change it once the NCAA changed the rule and, and we didn't waste any time, you know, so we're excited about that. And, you know, like I said, you, you let's, let's play it out on the field. It shouldn't be a regional winner. It should be a, a team that's done it on the field through nine games and, and excited about where our league is headed. Washington State head coach Jake Dickert join us, joining us here at the uh, Voice of College Football. I know it seems like a long summer on one hand, but at the same time, we're about two months away from Pac-12 media days, and that's going to go yeah. right into August camp. And before you know it, you're lining up against Idaho, and then you got a game against Wisconsin that people are going to be paying a whole lot of attention to. So we appreciate you stopping by, Coach. It's been a great discussion, and, th and thanks so much for the time, and, and good luck this season. Anytime. I appreciate it. Go Cougs.